there's a saying that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And that's because autism is a spectrum disorder. It affects people in many different ways. But in every case, that person has difficulties understanding and navigating the social world. They have trouble making eye contact, reading facial expressions and gestures, forming social relationships. Now, we know that autism begins in the prenatal period, and we can actually diagnose autism when a child is 18 months of age. And yet, the average age of diagnosis in the United States is close to five years. And if you're a child from an African-American background, it's going to be much older. And what that means is that we're missing very important years when the brain is rapidly developing, it's plastic, and it would be most responsive to early intervention. Now, we know that genes set the stage. They, they do contribute to autism in terms of its cause, but it's actually experiences that shape the circuits in the brain. A baby's brain will have twice as many connections between brain cells as it will have when it's adult. And when it interacts with the environment, those connections, those synapses that are used will be retained, and those that are not used will die away. And in this way, our experiences actually shape the circuits in our brain. Now, this synaptic pruning process is disrupted in autism. And that's because the baby with autism is paying attention to the world in a very different way. This is a picture of a one-year-old who will later develop autism. And it's at his first birthday party. People are singing to him, they're making uh, eye contact, they're smiling, and yet that baby is paying attention to the cake and not the people around him. Compare this to a typical baby in the same scene, and this baby is noticing all those people around him and engaging. And what this means is that the young infant with autism is not receiving the normal kind of stimulation to the areas of the brain that are important for language development and social development during this early period when the brain is developing. Now, at Duke, our goal is to identify infants who are at risk for autism even before those symptoms emerge. And we're doing this by looking for what we call biomarkers. So these are biological changes that we can measure. Some of them we're measuring in the blood, such as changes related to the immune system. We look in, at patterns of expression of genes. We can also look at the structure of the brain through MRI. Or in this study, we used electrophysiology to measure the dynamic activity of the brain, those neurons. And we found that by eight months of age, a baby who's going to go on to develop autism is already showing a different pattern of functional connectivity between different parts of the brain, particularly the frontal lobe. And we know that the frontal lobe is very important for social and language development. Now, we were interested in whether early intervention could make a difference and change this early pattern of atypical brain development. So my colleague Sally Rogers and I developed an intervention called the Early Start Denver Model, where we taught therapists to bring that baby's attention back to an adult and to interact socially and to learn language and learn how to play. And we've now conducted studies funded by the National Institute of Health, randomized clinical trials, where we've shown that when you provide these early interventions, that the impact on outcome is very significant. The average IQ gain of a child who receives these interventions is 17 points. That's over a standard deviation. Now, in 2012, we published a study where we actually showed that early intervention not only affects behavioral development, but it affects brain development. So we used electrophysiology to show that we actually had changed the patterns in the brain. And we showed that children who received early intervention now were showing normal patterns of brain activity. And Time Magazine recognized this as one of the top 10 medical breakthroughs of 2012. And I think the reason why people were so excited is because it said that the brain of a child with autism is very responsive, very plastic, and that early intervention can make a difference. 
Now, this kind of work has been important in our advocacy because historically, people have not had access to early intervention because there's no insurance coverage that would pay for it. And so parents often would pay out of pocket. They would get a second mortgage or not send their other child to college in order to be able to pay for intervention. In fact, in North Carolina, just last year, we finally passed a bill that will pay for or provide insurance coverage for early intervention. So in this, yes. And by the way, it took a lot of work. And when, and when McCrory signed that bill, he acknowledged that Duke was instrumental in the passage of that bill. So we had to work for that. Um, but in this picture, I've just testified to the US Senate on behalf of a bill that would pay for insurance coverage for early intervention for our military families. And here I'm talking to Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who's been a wonderful advocate for children's health. Now, in most parts of the world, uh, there are no trained professionals to provide early intervention. And even if we could train them, they just, there's not enough of them for the number of people that need them. And so Sally Rogers and I decided to create a version of the Early Start Denver model that could be delivered by parents. And we found that parents are very good at this. They can learn to use those strategies to promote language and social development. And now the Early Start Denver model has been translated into 14 languages. It's used worldwide. And in fact, in China, the Ministry of Health is paying for a very large clinical trial where they're teaching parents in China to deliver these interventions with very positive outcomes. And more recently, Lauren Franz, who's a young psychiatrist at Duke, received funding from the National Institutes of Health, where she's going to be teaching families in the villages of South Africa to be able to provide these interventions to their children. So we're really hopeful that these kind of approaches will be able to begin to address the need uh, for treatment on a global scale. Now, as you can tell, I'm very excited about early intervention, and behavioral intervention does have a very big impact on outcome. But unfortunately, there are many people that despite having received those interventions, continue to struggle. About 25% of people with autism never learn to speak. And so our work is not done. And one of the reasons why I was very excited to come to Duke is because there are scientists that are studying molecular or cellular therapies that are designed to enhance neuroplasticity and synaptic function and could hopefully help those individuals who were not as responsive to early intervention be able to have better outcomes. Now, currently, there are no FDA-approved drugs that address the core symptoms of autism that are designed to improve social and language and those uh, core symptoms that we think of as autism itself. And yet, at Duke, we're currently conducting five clinical trials that are testing molecular or cellular therapies that are addressing core symptoms and are designed to enhance neuroplasticity. Now, I'm going to end by just telling you about one of those trials, but if you're interested in the others, I'll be um, around during the supper period, and I'm happy to talk about the rest of them. But the work I'm going to tell you about is work that I'm conducting with a renowned pediatrician, Joanne Kurtzberg, and it's such an honor to be collaborating with her. And she has been at the forefront in testing umbilical cord blood as a treatment for a wide range of conditions, all the way from conditions that affect infants through now looking at adult stroke. But these are all conditions that affect the brain. And the rationale behind this approach is that there's increasing evidence that autism, at least in some cases, involves neuroinflammation. So in this slide that you see above me, it's a PET scan. And you can see on the bottom that the scan of the person with autism has cells called microglia that are very activated. The microglia are the immune system in our brain. And compare that to the image of the brain from a typical person. Now, what Dr. Kurtzberg has shown is that cord blood, which contains stem cells, has the effect of dampening that microglia, which we know interferes with synaptic functioning. 
and then it promotes brain development, and particularly functional connectivity. And with a very generous gift from the Marcus Foundation, we've now launched a program of research where we're looking at cord blood treatment, not only for autism, but cerebral palsy and stroke. And we've just finished our first open-label clinical trial for young children with autism. These are two to six-year-olds. They come to, to Duke, they have one infusion of cord blood, and then we followed them for a year. And we studied not only their behavioral development, but also their brain development. And what we found was that about 60% of those children actually did show significant improvements in their ability to socially interact and in their language skills. And these were correlated with changes that we could measure with MRI, where we could see that the brain was becoming more normally developed and functionally connected. Now, this was an open-label trial. It means we didn't have a control group. So we don't know yet whether this actually was due to the cord blood treatment. But this summer, we will launch a very large, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. And at the end of that trial, we'll have a better understanding of whether this might be an effective treatment for autism. So I'm going to end with this beautiful painting. And this is a painting that is by Jessie Park. She's a self-taught artist with autism. So thank you very much. <laughs>